Good afternoon. I'm Allison Baker. I'm a partner here in Venable's Consumer Financial Services Practice. Welcome to our webinar today, State Enforcement Activity in the Consumer Financial Services Industry um, in 2018. It's uh, quite a hot topic that we've all been following for the last couple of years. And I have with me today a really great panel of experts on this. Um, first, I want to introduce Peter Kazik, who is one of our co-heads of our State Attorney General practice. Um, then I'd like to introduce Meredith Boylan, who is also um, a member of our Consumer Financial Services team. And finally, I will introduce Joe Robbins, or they'll introduce themselves, who's also a member of our Consumer Financial Services team. So Peter, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Kazik. Uh, I previously was um, the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legislative Affairs at the U.S. Department of Justice uh, for the second term of the Obama administration. And prior to that, I was in private practice for 30 years with a practice focused primarily on uh, state attorney general investigations and litigation, uh, as well as antitrust and, and other matters. So I've got a good familiarity with the state AG world, and uh, I'll be interested in talking to you about it. Meredith. Good afternoon. My name is Meredith Boylan. I'm an attorney in, in our uh, litigation group here at Venable. Prior to joining the firm, I was an assistant district attorney in Manhattan, and uh, I spend a lot of time doing consumer financial protection work with Allison and our team here. Joe. I'm Joe Robbins. I'm a six-year associate in our consumer financial services practice. I have uh, been with the firm for about a year and a half now, and before that, I was in the consumer financial services group at Goodwin Proctor. Well, thank you for joining us. So what spurred our interest in this conversation today was a speech that Acting Director Mick Mulvaney, Mick Mulvaney is the Acting Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection as he's recently renamed the agency. And in February of this past year, he gave a speech to the National Association of Attorneys General, also called NAG, in which he discussed the interplay between the Attorneys General and the CFPB and specifically there was one sentence that we took away from that which really um, caused us to think hard about how these, the agency, the bureau, and the state AGs would be working together going forward. And that sentence, we are going to be looking to the state regulators and the state attorneys general for a lot more leadership when it comes to enforcement. Why we think we know better how to protect consumers in your state than you do surprises me a little bit. I don't think you'll be seeing us doing much of that anymore, Mr. Mulvaney remarked, and this was a speech he gave to the NAG. And it's in light of this speech that we jump off today with a conversation about how we think the interplay between the state AGs and the CFPB will, uh, will go forward. Um, of course, we're waiting um, to, to have a new director of the CFPB, Kathy Craninger, who's been nominated. Um, and I suspect that her administration will be quite a bit different than Rich Cordray's administration. Um, Joe, if you can give us some sense to start off with of what exactly the Dodd-Frank Act, which is the enabling act that um, the CFPB's organic statute contemplates the state AGs enforcing federal consumer financial laws. And Joe, I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of lay of that land and help us get oriented here as we start to think about how and we start to talk about what we've already observed the last couple of years about the state AGs and the CFPB. Sure. Um, so Title 10 of the Dodd-Frank Act, aka the Consumer Financial Protection Act of 2010, or the CFPA, um, the federal statute is uh, typically thought of as a weapon of the Bureau, uh, the federal regulatory entity which was created by that statute, but not to be overlooked is the fact that the CFP Act also expressly confers enforcement authority upon states too. Uh, specifically, 12 U.S.C. 5552A1 gives both state AGs and state regulators authority to bring cases enforcing the CFPX federal prohibition against unfair, deceptive, or abusive extra practices, aka UDAP, which is found in 12 U.S.C. 5531 and 5536, as well as, quote, provisions of this title or regulations issued under this title. So that includes things like ACOA, FDCPA, FICRA, TILA, RESPA, and so on. And these are listed out at 12 U.S.C. 5481, sub 12, defining enumerated consumer laws. So, so those enumerated consumer finance laws, of which I believe there are 18, are laws that predate the CFPA, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also the organic authority in the Consumer Financial Protection Act itself, which is UDAP. 
what I what I'm curious about, and, and I'd be curious to get everyone's thoughts on this a little bit, is the the Dodd Frank Act contemplates the state AGs making law under the UDAP provisions of the CFPA in part, which is fascinating because usually in, in most legislative and, and regulatory regimes, it's the agency whose authority uh, the statute the statute gives authority to a certain agency, and usually that agency itself has near exclusive authority to to make the law to to kind of build out the doctrine associated with that law. But this is unique, um, Peter. I'm I'm curious about your thoughts on that, um, given your expertise in this space and your extremely long um, and illustrious career um, advocating and litigating in front of state AGs. Well, it's certainly something that the AGs uh, enjoy and, and look forward to uh, doing their best to try and create some law under the Act. You know, they have always thought that they should be the primary regulators of financial services. They were a little bit uh, miffed when the CFPB came along, but they're now getting comfortable with it. And quite frankly, given Mulvaney's current nod of the hat to them, they're sort of going to take the lead. Uh, Joe, what other kinds of enforcement tools does the Dodd-Frank contemplate, and do you understand that to also inure to the benefit of state AGs? Um, yes, I think that it does. Um, there are, so I guess one might ask, you know, since the states already had their own state law that they could use, why would they bother using this new federal statute? And I think this slide, um, you know, presents some things to be aware of in terms of the advantages um, and tools that the, um, the CFP Act provides that state law may not provide. Um, one, for example, um, is that a broader array of conduct um, might be covered under the CFPA than is under state law. For example, um, you know, having the term abusive as part of the, the federal UDAP statute. Uh, many states, their UDAP statute would just say unfair or deceptive practices. Um, and as is covered in a later slide, you even see now states trying to mimic the federal CFPA by adding the word abusive into their statute. Um, so that's one difference. Um, I think a second difference is that the CFPA may confer more extensive remedies. Um, if you look at that list here on the slide, it's um, it's pretty robust, um, and you know. And in addition to what's listed there, the statute also authorizes expressly authorizes states, in particular, to recover their costs in connection with prosecuting the action um, if the state is a prevailing party in the action. Um, and in terms of the civil money penalties, uh, the for a first tier violation, it's five thousand dollars a day. Um, for the second tier violation, for reckless violations, it goes it can be up to twenty five thousand dollars a day. And if there's a third tier violation, um, which is for knowing violations, that can be up to a million dollars per day. So this is quite extensive. Um, granted, the statute also provides mitigating factors such as the the size of financial resources, good faith, the gravity of the violation, history of previous violations, and so forth. Um, and third. Um, you know, it may allow more entities within a state to sue because it provides for both state AGs and state regulators to sue. Um, and to sort of circle back to the question you presented to Peter, I think, um, you know, that's one area where the, where the notice and participation provisions of, of the CFPA might have taken on some, some newfound importance that they might not have had before. Um, you know, in an era where under former director Cordray was probably thought that if a state wanted to bring an action, uh, Cordray is not going to try to get in the way of it. Um, now under new leadership that has articulated that it envisions a more restrained federal enforcement role, um, you know, less um, regulation by enforcement, as well as a desire to consistently enforce the law, um, you know, you could, which wouldn't happen necessarily if, like you said, you have different states enforcing this differently. Um, you could envision a scenario where the Bureau actually tries to play an active role in getting involved in actions brought under the CFPA by state AGs to try to create some uniformity like that or make sure there isn't too much regulation. Um, and so I thought it was worth discussing just briefly what these notice and participation provisions actually say. Um, under Section 5552B1A, it says that before initiating an action, um, the state shall timely provide a copy of the complete complaint um, and written notice describing such action to the Bureau and the Prudential Regulator, if any. And then in terms of the participation provision, it says that the Bureau may 
intervene in the action as a party, remove the action to federal court if it was not originally brought there, and be heard on all matters arising in the action, and appeal any order or judgment to the same extent as any other party in the proceeding. So what I see there is that the Bureau can't actually veto or stop a state from bringing a case under the CFBA, but the Bureau could intervene in the case as a party and oppose the state in the case and query how likely a state is to win under the federal CFPA if the Bureau is on the other side of the V. And I think the possibility of that happening was not lost on the state AGs uh, because when Mulvaney came to speak uh, before them at the National Association of Attorneys General in February 2018, uh, the Pennsylvania AG, Josh Shapiro, asked Mulvaney about this point blank. And, his, and Mulvaney's answer to applause from the room was, quote, if we think it is a good case, we'll bring it. If not, we're happy to let you do it by yourself. And he also said, quote, we are not there to get in your way. And then he echoed that in similar remarks a few weeks later to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce when he said, quote, the statute allows the state AGs to enforce the federal laws. How they choose to do that is up to them, and I don't think it's my role to tell the state AGs what they can and can't do. Um, so that's at least what he said early in his term, and I think so far as we're aware, he seems to be keeping his word on that so far at least. Um, so I wanted to go back to something you said earlier, Joe, about the use um, or the importing of the concept of abusive into either state laws and or the use of the abusive provision in the Dodd-Frank Act by the states. And Meredith, you do a lot of this work, um, both at the state level and at the federal level. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about this concept of abusive, which hasn't been built out as a legal doctrine. I mean, if you ask 15 people who are consumer finance attorneys what abusive means, you'll get 15 different answers. There isn't a lot of precedent. So, you know, how do you manage that if you're, if you're trying to game what a state AG might do under this regime? Right. It's very perilous for um, businesses that operate in the consumer financial space because of the ambiguity around the term and because most of the development and interpretation of what that term is or may mean is likely to be done through enforcement actions, which is a, a, a pretty awful way to, <laughs> to legislate. But um, unfortunately, I think that that's how it's going to be developed and has been developed thus far is, is, is reading these different consent agreements that the states and the CFPB have brought against different providers and trying to suss out how they are utilizing that abusive prong and how they're applying it to different conduct. Um, I think that that's very helpful, and, and I know that we have, Joe, um, a couple of examples of states using the Dodd-Frank Act or the Consumer Financial Protection Act, which is, of course, Title 10 of the Dodd-Frank Act, and maybe if you can walk us through a couple of those examples. Um, I, you know, they give us a little bit of insight here, but again, I, I do think to some extent, especially with respect to abusive, you know, we are in somewhat new territory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this, um, the 2014 Illinois versus Alta Colleges case um, is, you know, example that even though we have a new president and we have a new acting director of the Bureau, um, states using the CFP uh, Act is not new. That, that has been happening for some time now. Um, and in that case, that 2014 case, um, you know, there was actually litigation over whether states, you know, do have authority under the federal act um, to bring suit under it. And there the defendant argued that states have no independent enforcement power um, under the CFPA because they can only sue as a proxy for the Bureau. And, and the Bureau is unconstitutionally structured, so therefore state AGs can't sue either. And the court there expressly rejected that argument and noting that um, Section uh, 5552 expressly authorizes uh, states to sue on their own behalf in their own name. And in a, a recent filing in another case, the New York Attorney General noted that it has found no cases to the contrary to date. Um, there are no cases that have ever raised any doubt about the fact that the state AGs are authorized um, by Section 5552 to bring suit there under. Um, however, I think this RD legal funding case mentioned in the next bullet um, is very interesting. Um, as of this past June 21, 
in a, in a, I think, remarkable development. There is now, for the first time, what appears to be legal precedent supporting the argument that the entire CFPA is unconstitutionally invalid, such that states can't sue under it either. Um, and to put this in context, I think as our audience probably well knows that litigation around the constitutionality of the Bureau structure has been out there for a while. Um, you know, the early cases um, had upheld the Bureau's um, constitutionality. Um, then in the fall of 2016, um, there were two cases holding that the Bureau was unconstitutionally structured but that the remedy was just to sever the four cause removal provision from the CFPA and make the director removable by the president at will. Um, one was the DC Circuit's October 2016 panel decision in the PHH case, uh, which as we know later got vacated and then overturned by the DC Circuit on bank in May 2017. And the other was a CFPB versus DND marketing in um, the Central District of California, which is currently on appeal. But in both of those cases, there was no question that the CFPA would still survive, um, which would also mean that it was still there for states to sue under. And that's what makes this RD legal funding case so interesting is once this came along, um, from SBNY Judge Loretta Preska, uh, who is a George H.W. Bush appointee, um, that has changed. Um, in her opinion, she says, um, at page 31, uh, and I'll read from it because I think it's interesting, said, quote, defendants devote significant space in arguing uh, that the CFPA claim should be dismissed because the CFPB is unconstitutionally structured and thus lacks authority to bring such claims. Vexingly, defendants do not address the, the New York Attorney General's independent authority to bring claims in federal district court under the CFPA without regard to the constitutionality of the CFPB's structure. And then she actually cites uh, 5552, saying that that expressly authorizes state AGs to sue under the CFPA, and uh, concludes, therefore, um, Federal question uh, subject matter jurisdiction over the CFPA claims exists regardless of the constitutionality of the CFPB structure. Um, so nothing new so far, but then in a surprise ending to the opinion, just a few pages later, uh, the opinion says that it adopts Judge Brett Kavanaugh's dissent in PHH, concluding that the Bureau is unconstitutionally structured but, quote, disagrees with Section 5 of Judge Kavanaugh's opinion, wherein he determined the remedy to be to, quote, invalidate and sever the four-cause removal provision and hold that the director of the CFPB may be supervised, directed, and removed at will by the president. Instead, the court adopts Section 2 of Judge Karen LaCraft Henderson's dissent, wherein she opined that, quote, the presumption of severability is rebutted here. A severability clause does not give the court power to amend a statute, nor is it a license to cut out the heart of a statute. Because the four-cause removal provision is at the heart of Title 10 of the Dodd-Frank Act, I would strike Title 10 in its entirety. And so essentially, the opinion dismisses uh, the CFEB from the case, terminates it from a, uh, as a party from the case, dismisses the CFBA claims. Um, and so, you know, not in a hypothetical sense, but in a very real way, because this case also happens to have the New York Attorney General as a plaintiff in the case, we reach the question, well, if the entire CFPA is unconstitutional, doesn't that mean states can't sue under it either? And if you're confused about what Judge Preska's answer was, so are the parties in this case. <laughs> Um, since the June opinion, the parties have exchanged a, a flurry of letters to the court trying to get clarity on this. Um, about a month after the opinion, defendants filed a letter motion to dismiss uh, the New York AG's federal CFPA claims for lack of jurisdiction, basically making this argument that because since the court struck the CFPA in its entirety, um, the court thereby struck both the provision authorizing state AGs to sue under the, CFPB, uh, under the CFPA, as well as the substantive UDAP provisions that form the basis of those federal claims. And the, uh, the New York AG responded, citing the other part of uh, Judge Preska's opinion, which said that uh, states have independent authority to sue under the CFPA, and uh, that the claims, the, the New York AG's uh, CFPA claims survive regardless of the constitutionality of the Bureau structure. And um, the, the state AG also tried to distinguish Judge Henderson's dissent by saying, well, that was just sort of focused on the Bureau's structure and it being independent from the president. 
and it didn't ever talk about state AGs suing under the CFPA. Um, so you might ask, where does the Bureau come out on all of this because it was part of this case? And I would note first that the Bureau had submitted a, a filing ratifying um, that the Bureau is bringing this suit under Mulvaney. So, so the, the Bureau was not an unwilling plaintiff here. They wanted to be in this case. Um, what they wanted to do was have the dismissal against them certified so that they could appeal it immediately. Um, and interestingly, in their request for that, uh, the Bureau cited the participation provisions um, in the CFPA, uh, 5552, and arguing that immediate appeal was needed because if the, if the state AG is permitted to proceed with its CFPA claims, then that deprives the Bureau of its, quote, statutorily assigned right to participate in the litigation of CFPA claims brought by state regulators. Um, so the defendants didn't oppose the, the Bureau's request to certify this so they can appeal. Um, they did request a stay of the case pending the Bureau's appeal and or that the judge permit interlocutory appeal of the, the remaining claims in the case. Um, so the constitutionality issues could be addressed together in one appeal. Um, and interestingly, the defendants pointed to the Bureau's participation argument as supporting their request for the stay. Um, and the New York Attorney General responded saying, no, we oppose both. We don't want to stay. You know, we need to push forward to help these people and we don't want interlocutory appeal either. Um, and then in what might be an example of uh, current day relations or negotiations between the Bureau and states, uh, the Bureau ended up submitting a very short two-paragraph filing saying, no, 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 we didn't endorse a stay, we, we don't take any position on that, which may have been to not irk the New York Attorney General. Um, and so ultimately this culminates um, on August 23rd, the court certified the Bureau's dismissal um, so that it can appeal immediately. It stayed the case. Uh, which defendants wanted, and the New York AG did not, um, but denied interlocutory appeal of the remaining claims. And I think to the frustration of everybody involved, the order was written in such a way that it did not clarify whether the New York AG's federal CFBA claims survived or not. And, but interesting though, interestingly though, the order did state that, quote, final disposition of the Bureau's appeal alone will, quote, materially advance the ultimate termination of the litigation because it will bring certainty to the parties in their litigation of the federal issues presented. So, so this is as clear as mud. Yeah. And um, which brings us to the next question that I have for Peter, which is if the states can't pursue CFPA claims, and, and I'm not sure one Southern District of New York district court opinion holds the day on that or carries the day on that, especially if it goes up to the Second Circuit where it's likely to probably not stay, hold, if you will. Um, but I think it's worth noting that there are specific differences among some of the bigger states and, and more active states and what they can do in terms of investigating parties in the financial services space and also how some of those powers and authorities differ from what the CFPB can do. And Peter, if you can kind of give us a sense of that, that would be really helpful to help us think about this some more. So, you know, let's, let's backtrack a little bit. When uh, Mulvaney took over, uh, 16 state attorneys general, not surprising all Democrats, sent a letter to the Bureau talking about the, the request for <coughs> information regarding Bureau civil investigative demands and associated processes. And they, in, in essence, urged the Bureau not to cut back on their activities. And in, in that letter, they also laid out their claim to fame and all of the ways in which they could bring these actions. Now, the AGs have the authority to bring multi-state actions, which is one of the, the key provisions here, is that you get a bunch of states together, they, you get the resources, and they have the, the ability and the authority to bring larger actions than they could bring as, as small states. And so, for example, uh, in the multi-state effort against PHH Mortgage Corporation, they, there they went without the CFPB uh, and, and got a, a good result. You know, there have been a number of multi-states with uh, the CFPB, J.P. Morgan Chase on uh, debt collection practices, Alley Financial, Bank of America, and other uh, financial institutions on their foreclosure practices. Corinthian Colleges, uh, a student lending case. 
uh, Rome Finance charging military service members inflated rates and uh, other deceptive practices. And then there have been all those companies that uh, allegedly scammed 9-11 first responders to get their compensation payments, uh, a network of fly-by-night debt collection uh, companies that have deceived consumers into paying uh, inflated debts. They've all been subject to these multi-state actions. So the question then is, what what else can they do? Now, in the in the the Bureau is authorized to investigate information relevant to the violation of a provision of federal consumer financial law. And that's, you know, a, a pretty broad authority, but it's not anywhere near as broad as the authority that the state AGs have. So, for example, New York's Attorney General is authorized to investigate repeated fraudulent or illegal acts or otherwise persistent fraud or illegality in the carrying on or conducting of transaction of business for deceptive acts or practices in the conduct of any business. Well, that's a broader mandate than looking at violations of federal uh, consumer financial law. So essentially, the, the provisions of the New York executive law that give the Attorney General uh, these authorities have been interpreted to give them broad investigative authority. Uh, in California, not only does the Attorney General, but the head of each department in the state uh, is authorized to investigate all matters relating to the business activities and subjects under the jurisdiction of the department and violations of any rule or order of the department. So all of these uh, authorities within the state context give the attorney generals or uh, in California the, the heads of the departments of the state broad authority to investigate uh, these kinds of violations. So they're not as strictly limited to the consumer financial laws as the CFPB is, but they can add those claims on to the CFPB claims that they're uh, litigating. And I note that in California, when you're talking, for example, and this is true about a lot of states where you have that regulatory authority, they're licensing entities too. That's right. So they hold a license. The CFPB is not a licensing entity, so you know they can, they can impose pretty substantial fines on you, but they can't yank your license. That's right. Um, and in California, I know in particular, that's a pretty active group of uh, departments out there. That's exactly right. Yeah. And they're not afraid to use that authority. Um, and the other thing that uh, gives uh, the Attorney General uh, a broad authority is what, they're, what they have the ability to seek. You know, under the Bureau's um, statute, they can seek the production of documents or other tangible things, written reports, answers to questions, or oral testimony. Similarly, the Virginia AG, like most, has the authority to issue CIDs, written interrogatories, take oral testimony, and uh, investigate sub uh, suspected violations of consumer protection law. Now, there are a couple of examples where it's the state uh, authority isn't as broad. In New Mexico, uh, they have a CID provision to authorize the state AG to seek documented material, but not to seek oral testimony under oath. But I thought another interesting case, well, while not in the consumer financial protection sphere, but the New York State Attorney General has been investigating Exxon for two years over their disclosure of climate change uh, impact on the company. And the, the allegation by the state AG is that they're saying one thing to, to their stockholders and to consumers, and another thing internally as to what kind of impact this could have on the company. So the state AG went to court. Uh, to try and enforce a subpoena uh, for financial disclosures to investors rega regarding climate change. And the judge enforced the subpoena, but he said, this investigation has been going on for two years. It's gotta, it isn't going to go on interminably. And so that's the first time I've seen a state court say to an AG, you've got to bring it on or give it up. And so that we may see more activity in that area uh, when the... Um, when these investigations go on for, and, and as the judge said, an interminable length of time. Um, and then the other uh, uh, difference in the standards are for challenging a subpoena or a CID. You know, whenever the, 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 the statute says that whenever the Bureau has a reason to believe that any person may have information relevant to a violation, the Bureau can serve a CID on that person. In New York, however, you know, the, the information sought just has to bear a reasonable relationship to the subject matter under investigation and public interest to be served. 
and there's a, and all you have to do is show that the attorney general is acting in good faith, and there's a presumption of that. So in that case, in the American Dental Co-op case, the court denied the motion to quash the subpoena. In many states, you know, New York, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Maryland, AGs have the authority to investigate merely on suspicion that the law is being violated, which is a much broader authority, I think, than the authority that the Bureau was given when they can only bring a, a, an investigation when they have a reason to believe that any person may have violated the law. And, and following up on that, one of the interesting things that we see in our practice a lot is you know, the leverage that a state AG, or for that matter, the CFPB has over a party is the non-public nature of the investigation. And so if you want to seek to quash a CID or a subpoena, you have to go into court. And almost always those, those actions are public. It's very hard to keep them out of, out of view. Um, we, we litigated an issue in this space um, in the District of D.C. with the CFPB a few years back, and we were able to keep it confidential, but it's pretty unprecedented. Um, and I wonder, Peter, from your experience, how that informs, you know, you've got fairly broad, expansive authority, you've got states that aren't hemmed in by a lot, including subject matter, and then you've got the specter of something being public if you, if you dare to challenge the scope of the CID, like the Exxon case, but Exxon, I think, made a decision that it was willing to take that right. risk. But that, that challenge has been very publicly discussed in a lot of places. But what are your thoughts on that and how you kind of you, you, you manage that tension between give us everything in the kitchen sink and the only way you can challenge that is to go into court and announce to the world that you're now the subject of an investigation? Well, it, it's again, it's a, <clears throat> it's a question of when they bring the CID forward and you're ultimately involved in, in a negotiation with the AG's office over what they really want, what they really need. And in the majority of the cases, you can resolve that behind closed doors without making the matter public. But in the, the big ticket item cases, like the Exxon climate change case, they're not going to give up because they know that if you're going to go and file a motion, you're going to bring publicity to this and you're going to suffer the consequences. So it gives the AG another sledgehammer to use to get participation and cooperation from the recipients of a subpoena. So one of the things that is interesting in this space is we, we and, and what Joe talked a little bit about with the RD legal matter in the Southern District of New York and what Peter continues to talk about in terms of what we learn about both that's public and not so public is how we continue to see consumer finance enforcement actions emerging um, in the state AG space and the state regulatory space. Meredith, I know you spend... Um, a lot of your day with me um, on these matters. And so I'm curious what you're seeing in your space and what you're seeing out there in the world. And, um, you know, given your, your background, um, both in terms of the state space, but also the federal space, how, how, do these, how do these actions that we're seeing right now compare um, to what you maybe have seen in the past? Well, I definitely think that we what we've seen is consistent with what is being reported in you know, the, the industry publications, which is in the perceived void and, and maybe now real void that the CFPB is is leaving, the state attorneys general have certainly um, become even more aggressive than they were in years past, both I, I think with, the vo with respect to the volume of the investigations that they're bringing and, and maybe the scope of the individual investigations. Um, you know, one of the points that I think is worth noting is that there are 30, I believe, seats up for uh, election this year in the states. So, you know, that's also um, a little bit of a perfect storm for, for uh, demonstrating how aggressive and tough-minded you are, particularly in the consumer protection arena. Um, and so, you know, in addition to, to the individual um, actions that we're seeing, you can see on the slide that there are a number of um, structural changes that different states and, and attorney general uh, offices have, have been making. Um, in New Jersey, on March 2018, the attorney general created a state-level CFPB, which is the New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs, to fill the void left by the administration's pullback of the CFPB. Um, in a press release that accompanied the announcement of that bureau, 
the state attorney general went so far as to say that the federal government had abandoned its responsibility to protect consumers from financial fraudsters. Um, I don't know that I would go that far as far as the, the CFPB, but um, it certainly is indicative, I think, of the mentality and the, and the, the real um, uh, consumer protection aggression that the that states are, are demonstrating these days. Um, similarly, in Pennsylvania, the state attorney general also created a consumer financial protection unit um, with, according to the press release, a focus on lenders and lenders that specifically, quote unquote, prey on seniors, students, and the military. And I think that those three categories, seniors, students, and the military, have always been um, a, a group of, of constituents that the states are um, careful protecting. Um, and I think that they're just going to continue to be scrutinizing practices in those um, particular categories. You talked about elections. And then you mentioned three vulnerable consumer segments, and I wonder, you know, not to be, I don't want to be cynical, but, but there definitely is a sense that AGs like to explain to their constituents what they do, and I think we can all agree that students and seniors and service members are especially vulnerable, but I'm curious what you see in that space. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with all of that, and, you know, particularly, I know we've, we've spent a lot of time um, and, and paid a lot of attention to the developments in the student lending space. And that's, that's a very hot topic um, both on both sides of the aisle. Um, and that's, we're going to talk some more about that in, in a little while. But, you know, I, I do think that the states are, I, I don't, don't want to be cynical, but they are recognizing that there, there is a, a popular momentum um, with, with the younger generation and, and maybe the older generation as well. And so, to the extent that they appear to be advocating um, for those protected classes who might also be um, more likely to vote in elections, I, I don't know that that's a coincidence. But um, in Maryland, the state enacted the Financial Consumer Protection Act, which, as Joe mentioned earlier, um, seeks to align the Maryland law with the uh, CFPA. It, it includes an abusive practices uh, element under its UDAP uh, scheme. It has upped civil money penalties, and it has required the governor to appropriate funding for state enforcement. Uh, according to the press release, that was about $700,000 that was allocated to the Office of the Attorney General. So that'll presumably allow them to hire some more attorneys to carry out their work. And also, consistent with the focus on student lending, the Maryland state has a appointed a student loan ombudsman. Um, and one other more you know, novel aspect of this is they are also focusing on cryptocurrencies and cyber currencies, which um, I know is we've all seen the press around that, which is a, an emerging field for both um, businesses and for the entities that regulate them. Uh, Again, the, the state enforcement activity, some of this was covered earlier uh, by Peter, but there was the PHH settlement, which was a $45 million settlement, $30 million of which went to borrowers. The AGs also received some payment out of that fund. Um, and in addition to the uh, monetary aspect of this, the, the settlement requires PHH to adhere to comprehensive mortgage, mortgage servicing standards. Um, also, we have a, a bullet about the Georgia State Attorney General regarding an $8.5 million settlement with a debt collector, um, which brought claims both under the federal FDCPA and the state uh, Georgia Fair Business Practices Act. Um, that $8.5 million settlement is, is, is interesting in that it wasn't all a cash payout. Um, it, it really stems from the AG requiring the debt collector to turn over almost 12,000 accounts that the debt collector had been working um, and that they're not allowed to see, they're not allowed to pursue collection on any more. The cash penalty was about $20,000. So you, you said something interesting, Meredith, um, when you were talking about the PHH mortgage settlement. Um, you said that the attorneys general received some of the funds that were part of the settlement. And I know that um, you and I know this from our own work in this space, that one of the things that often animates a state attorney general decision to pursue 
an enforcement action is the amount of monies that come back either to the state itself or to consumers. Um, and I wonder if, in your own experience, what you've seen in that space, because it often is the case that not only are politics and public policy informing these decisions, but there are some causes of action that just generate more fees and fines. Um, and if that informs in any way, for example, PHH, um, the, the, the methods or, or manners in which you think state AGs pursue some of these causes of action and cases. Right. I think that they're often looking to return monies to consumers. It's, it's an imperfect science. It's interesting, and sometimes I think it's, it's sort of arbitrary how they come up with these numbers. You know, sometimes it's a fixed dollar amount per consumer that was affected, depending, regardless of, of how an individual consumer actually may or may not have been harmed by the alleged activity. And in some cases, I, I think providers would argue that consumers didn't actually suffer any harm, that these are technical violations, um, that consumers received the services that they were entitled to or they were treated fairly through the process, um, yet none, nonetheless the estates are, are pursuing a, you know, a restitution theory or an unjust enrichment theory on the ground that um, a technical violation should be uh, you know, deemed almost a, a, a strict liability intentional harm standard. And so I think it can be very frustrating for attorneys and for their clients when they're negotiating um, fines and, and fees with the, the, the states and the federal regulators to, to try to come to a consensus as to, first of all, how to characterize them and also what the, what the amounts should be to, to actually reflect true harm and not just an arbitrarily high penalty to, to to be more of a penalty rather than a restitution. Um, a couple of more, again, they've been very busy, uh, a couple of more uh, recent enforcement actions. Um, New Mexico an announced in April a settlement with credit card providers over interchange fees, and these are the fees that are imposed on merchants when you swipe your card um, at the place of business. The allegation was that the, there was an anti-competitive nature to those and that any excess costs were being passed down to consumers through increased prices on costs and, of goods and services provided. Um, New Mexico touted in its press release that um, it had opted out of a nationwide class settlement on this issue, um, and that class settlement was ultimately rejected by the Second Circuit and cert was denied at the Supreme Court. So, you know, in, in that, in that case, it's interesting that New Mexico struck its own, charted its own course, and it actually panned out very well for, for the state there. Um, in Kansas, the state attorney general uh, obtained a judgment against a student loan uh, help center, um, which one of the allegations was that they were, they were marketing um, their services to help borrowers navigate uh, federal loan repayment programs and at, at a pretty inflated cost, um, whereas the state argued that the Department of Education really provides these services at, at no cost or, you know, you can go on their website and figure out what the what services you may be entitled to. Um, and the press release indicated that other states are also pursuing actions against these same, this same entity. Um, Virginia, this is another um, state where there's been both a kind of a confluence of enforcement activity and also beefing up their structure. Um, Virginia announced in November 2016 that it was expanding and reorganizing its consumer protection section. It doubled its <coughs> number of attorneys from five to 10 and added other professionals, including investigators. Um, they've also established different committees to monitor certain hot issues, um, including a lending committee, Consumer Advisory Committee and a Reasonable Rate Committee. And one of the units that they created is a predatory lending unit. Um, and this predatory lending unit is the unit that's credited with this February 2018 settlement um, with lenders and debt collectors, um, including open-ended credit, involving open-ended credit plan loans, um, which uh, are essentially, they can be, you know, credit cards or home equity lines of credit, that type of, of loan product. Um, one other notable 
point about Virginia and its structural changes is that, like the CFPB, Virginia has started its own consumer complaint database. Um, so now Virginia consumers can go in and, uh, you know, engage in a, certain, a similar uh, type of portal with, with the Virginia uh, regulators directly. Um, another Virginia action in, in May was against an online lender for um, uh, different practices associated with its, its licensing and including um, excess interest rates. Apparently in Virginia, there's a general cap of 12%, but um, there are some exceptions to that rule. Um, and apparently this, this uh, lender was alleged to have, you know, charged higher, substantially higher interest rates between 34 and 155% without falling into one of those exceptions. Um, We've seen Virginia take a real focused interest in lending and usury laws in particular. They have become a part of the cadre of active attorneys general in this space, and it sounds like your experience kind of enforces that thought, yeah. Yeah, and, and it, they seem to, you know, the, the, the predatory lending unit seems to be very active uh, based on these recent announcements, and, and uh, commensurate with that is the, the March 2018 announcement about future income payments, which is an entity that uh, was specializing in, quote, unquote, pension uh, payment or pension loans, and the, the allegation is that these pension buyouts are not actually buyout one time lump sum. You, you know, I'll buy, you know, I'll, I'll pay you uh, a certain portion of your, uh, you can sell me a certain portion of your payment. It was more of a, a, a loan with interest rates and fees that borrowers didn't understand that they were actually getting themselves into a long term loan product. They thought it was going to be a one time deal. Um, and on the next slide as well, there's a, a very similar action in Illinois against the same uh, uh, future income payments, LLC. Finally, on the uh, enforcement <laughs> front, the Washington Attorney General in May of 2018 announced a suit against a, a foreclosure um, group, and this this involves sales of a foreclosure sales surplus funds where again the the allegation stems from the business offering services to consumers at a high cost that the state believes the consumers could have taken advantage of at little or no cost to themselves meaning that if you are a borrower who goes through a foreclosure and there are funds at the end of the foreclosure sale that exceed the amount that you own your mortgage, those are typically placed into a fund at the courthouse and apparently there is a process that you fill out a form and you are entitled to recover those funds as the borrower. Um, this uh, business was advertising its services and taking a 50 or 60 percent cut of the, the proceeds to recover those funds and they were, according to the state, um, misadvising consumers as to the difficulty that they might encounter at the courts in recovering those monies. So, Meredith, I have a question for you, and, and maybe you can weigh in as well, Peter. Um, in your experience, you know, we, we've kind of looked at examples of state AG enforcement actions, and I know you're going to speak a little bit more about the state-federal cooperation efforts as well. Are there particular state attorneys general that you think are very active in this space? I mean, I think we know who they are, but we, we keep seeing a few others emerge as well. And if you want to talk about that, and maybe you can weigh in as well, Peter, that would be, I think, helpful for people to think about who are maybe listening to this call and wondering, well, gee, I don't do business in New Mexico, so I don't have to worry. But you probably do business in California, um, and you probably do business in New York. So I'm curious what you're seeing. Yeah, I think in, in the current environment, we're seeing a lot of the Democratic-leaning AGs being especially active. Um, of course, all of these attorneys general have pretty large portfolios. They're not all focused on consumers. That's one of their usual many of their their, their, their areas of enforcement. Um, and some, some may have more pet projects that, you know, different pet projects that appeal to them. But we've seen a lot of activity out of New York, out of Massachusetts, um, California, Illinois. Um, when you look at the, the, the press releases and the, the industry publications, they, those tend to be the, the heavy hitters in the space. There may be additional ones as well. That who else would you add to that list, Peter? I think I'd add uh, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. uh, and North Carolina and Oregon and Washington. 
Uh, all four states have uh, Democratic AGs. Uh, they're all consumer protection advocates. Uh, some of them are looking to run for higher office, not surprisingly. And so it's always a good consumer protection uh, ploy as well as a good constituent uh, protection ploy to, to bring these kinds of cases, get the publicity from. And I might add to that list Maryland and D.C. who are, um, who are also fairly active and also Iowa. Um, Tom Miller has for a long time been the kind of dean of the state AG world. Isn't that your experience? Oh, yeah, that's that's yeah. true. Tom Miller is, is uh, 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 a real consumer protection advocate. Now he's got doesn't have the resources of some of the other states, but he does uh, join multi states, uh, as do other smaller states. And that's you know that's the problem with the multi state investigation is it gives uh, the smaller states the authority to jump right in as well. And then you see um, you see his. I know some of the newer more recently elected AGs in the in this space who are particularly consumer protection focused have looked at Attorney General Miller and said he's kind of the dean of that bar even if he's in a state that maybe has fewer resources and maybe fewer people and you know that that seems to have been his role for years it sounds like um, and I think that that's interesting because um, you know when you do have a multi-state you almost inevitably see Iowa somewhere in that mix that's right yeah that's right. very interesting so what else are we seeing beside this um, proliferation of, of fairly activist state attorneys general in the wake of the Trump administration taking over in, in January 17? We're also seeing some federal enforcement cooperation nevertheless. And maybe you can talk a little bit about what you're seeing in that space, Meredith. And then Joe and Peter, feel free to also you know weigh in on some of this. So the, the most creatively named joint uh, effort is the Operation Game of Loans, which is the first bullet on the <laughs> here, uh, which is a, a FTC and state um, investigation or, or um, joint task force that is targeting debt. One of, the, one of the top things that they're targeting are debt relief scams. Um, and they're also, you know, particularly interested, again, in, in federal student lending, I believe, um, and what servicers or, or businesses who offer to help you navigate your, your federal student loans may charge you for um, and what you actually maybe need them for versus what you don't actually need them for. Um, also, there's a New York Attorney General and FTC recent announcement that they are suing, quote unquote, phantom debt brokers and collectors. Um, phantom debts are debts that were either fabricated by um, counterfeiting consumer information regarding their identities and their finances, or they may be debts that perhaps exist but are being actively disputed by consumers. Um, and then the last bullet on, on this slide is an announcement by the president that he was creating a multi-agency task force on market integrity and consumer fraud and calling for enhanced cooperation among federal and state authorities um, with a focus on fraud and financial crime. Um, the, the, the announcement itself, again, focuses on our our hot three, which is elderly, service members, veterans, and students. Um, and one of the agencies that is included in the task force is the Department of Education, um, which is interesting. We'll talk a little bit about the Department of Education later, but how where they, where they fall within the interplay between the states and the federal government in the consumer protection space. And Joe, I know that you've spent some time looking at this announced task force, and it's fairly early in its existence, but what, what are your thoughts on what you've seen so far and how it maybe compares to other type of task forces or collaborative efforts um, in the enforcement space? Well, I thought it was interesting just how broad it is, that it, it seems to try to include everybody and when you're doing something like that, I guess it sort of begs the question is, you know, it, you know, when there's so many um, cooks in the kitchen, is anything really going to be able to come from it? And, um, you know, ideally it will pan out that way. Um, but I thought, you know, this slide, one thing that this slide also said to me was sort of the absence of the, the Bureau being on it and that the FTC is shown kind of prevalently on that. And I wonder, you know, what that says about how 
you know, trying to paint um, you know the current administration with too broad a brush. Maybe some agencies are um, you know being more active and participatory than others. Well, I know the bureau is part of it, but you're right in saying that they're not the the main actors. And I think it's fair to say that maybe in the last administration. Uh, you know, Task Force on Market Integrity and Consumer Fraud, you might have seen the, the CFPB more prominently featured as opposed to it. Also, list, it may be the list with DOJ. Um, you know, you, you're definitely seeing a rescission of its role in that respect. Um, so, so in that vein, one of the things that um, is definitely also going on, I think, in this space is how we see um, states really seeking to, in, to influence the way that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, enforces consumer finance laws um, going forward. And I, and I have to say, um, from, my, from my vantage point, I've seen a market sea change in that effort in terms of state influence since January of 2017. Um, almost on cue, the inauguration was on a Friday, and that next business day would have been um, January uh, 23rd, and we saw a spate of complaints pop up in court um, within a couple days of that, um, which were clearly state AG efforts to influence the enforcement of federal consumer finance laws. Um, some of those efforts, though, haven't necessarily taken the, the role of litigation. I know, Meredith, you're kind of in the, the, the middle of this, so I'm curious what your thoughts are on all of that. Yeah, it was, it was I don't know that it was unexpected by those no. of us who practice in that in this area, but it was certainly interesting to see, um, you know, right after the inauguration, <coughs> the state attorneys general or certain state attorneys general, the, the Democratic leaning attorneys general, um, parachute in to active litigation, file notices of appearance, and seek to intervene um, in matters in which they were not parties or not really necessarily even involved, but they were. Uh, in seeking to intervene under the concern that the CFPB, which may have been a party <laughs> to these litigations, would not uh, aggressively advocate for the consumer's positions. And so the states came in and, you know, had to craft different type of uh, parens patriae and, 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 and different theories to allow them a um, seat at the table to litigate uh, on behalf of the consumers in their states in litigation um, involving the CFPAB in a private party. And so those were certainly interesting um, maneuvers. Yeah, we saw that in PHH. Most notably, um, the states sought to intervene at the D.C. Circuit, um, and it was definitely in response to a concern from their perspective that the CFPB's new administration might be less inclined to advocate for the agency itself, um, especially when it came to its constitutionality, which was front and center in that matter. And, and more recently, we've seen um, numbers of examples of states trying to influence the enforcement of federal consumer finance laws. I think what just the other day, Joe, we saw such an example. Um, and if you want to just talk briefly about that in, in, in terms of the, the use of the um, ECOA, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, and the way that that should be handled, um, I think Two days ago, the state, yeah. a group of state AGs wrote a letter about that. Yeah. Um, well, this was in response to um, remarks that um, Acting Director Mulvaney had made suggesting that they might be looking at ways to basically remove disparate impact liability theories um, from ACOA that basically in the fair lending space, typically there are you know, two different theories that you can pursue. One would be that um, the company committed you know, intentional discrimination. Um, also known as disparate treatment, um, but that can be hard to prove sometimes, um, especially try to get by, you know, past the pleading stage. And if instead you can go um, under a second separate theory, which is the disparate impact liability theory, which is basically just saying that the results, um, you know, even if you can't prove that it was intentional, you can basically bring like an unintentional discrimination theory based on just the results coming out a certain way. And you see, um, you know, people prosecuting those actions using statistical analysis and saying, you know, my statistical study show that, you know, you're liable. And, um, you know, especially in the auto lending space, this, um, you know, caused a lot of angst and people said that that was unfair. And it looked like uh, Mulvaney might be trying to do away with that. Um, at least under ECOA, I couldn't do it under the Fair Housing Act because the Supreme Court's already affirmed that. And so um, 
Yeah, just very recently, a couple of days ago, uh, a bunch of state AGs wrote a letter basically arguing and laying out the case why Mulvaney should not do that and should leave disparate impact liability in um, for ACOA, and that joins you know, a slew of other letters that they've now sent. And we've seen um, a fair amount back and forth, um, both in the kind of nitty-gritty legal issues that um, uh, Meredith and Peter are going to walk us through in a few minutes, but also in a more public advocacy role. And Peter, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. You know, every once in a while I'll see um, a state attorney general or a group of state AGs just make an announcement. We support what the CFPB does, and we think it should continue to exist as it has, and we think it should continue to uh, robustly enforce the consumer finance laws. Do you, you know, some of that is, 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 is advocacy, some of that is legal, and some of that, candidly, is for political reasons. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that interplay there. You know, we, we state AGs think the Bureau should exist without a lot of necessarily bringing a legal cause of action to, to support that. Well, I think part of it is to shore up support for the, for the Bureau. Uh, you know, there's uh, a significant amount of question as to how much this administration is going to put behind the Bureau, how it's going to uh, divvy up its resources and allow it to go forward. So the state AGs want to be out front supporting the Bureau, you know, saying that it has work to do uh, and that the AGs will support that work uh, and they, you know, are trying to, you know, both buck up the Bureau as well as position themselves as advocates for consumer protection in the financial services sector uh, in order to, you know, be able to say uh, when the time comes that they were the stalwart advocate whereas the Bureau, if it fades away, they don't have to worry about that anymore. And of course, you also have the, the counterpoint. I'm looking at that last bullet point where you've got 13 Republican state attorneys general and the Republican governor of Maine filing an amicus brief arguing that the Bureau's structure is unconstitutional. So you've got that counterpoint as well. Um, it's always struck me as um, interesting that the constitutionality of a federal agency is, is a politically charged issue um, quite like the Bureau has been, um, and maybe that's just because we're, we're fairly new in its history. Um, you know, you've been around Washington for a long time, Peter. <laughs> How does that strike you? <laughs> well, it, you know, it's, it's not a surprise. I mean, it, you know, you, in a number of areas, you know, not only in, with respect to the CFPB, but in, in other areas, you've got a bunch of Democratic state AGs taking one position, a bunch of Republican AGs taking another position, and they end up sort of facing off and it ultimately comes down to the strength of their arguments in amicus briefs and letters and the like. Uh, but nobody is going to leave a stone unturned, and they're not going to let the other side get an advantage by staking out a position without uh, the other side fucking it up. So, um, so Meredith, some of what's mentioned on this slide um, concerns um, state attorneys general um, writing into the Bureau in support of things like the Bureau's civil investigative demand process, its complaint database. That, I understand, came out of the request for information that yeah. the Bureau sent out. Can you talk a little bit more about those requests for information, which spurred a lot of commentary, and what the states were doing in response to some of those? Sure. So, um, with the new leadership at the CFPB, the CFPB has invited the public, including the industry and the states, uh, to provide comments on various procedures that the Bureau um, utilizes, one of which is the CID, the Civil Investigative Demand Process, and one of which is this CFPB database, which is, I'm sure, uh, everybody on the call knows, is a very, very large, I think they've received over one million um, consumer complaints that uh, is publicly accessible, can be filtered, can be sorted, and um, is not favored by the industry. <laughs> so these letters, though, that the, the states have sent, and again, this is the, these are largely divided along party lines, are very illuminating, not only with respect to how the states view the CFPB and its role, but also how they view themselves. Um, with respect to the CIDs, and this is this is echoed, um, echoing what Peter discussed earlier, in addition to arguing that the, the CFPB has always reasonably and um, fairly utilized the CID process and that the CID process, according to the states and the, and the Bureau, 
protect the due process rights of the entities for which the Bureau is investigating. Um, the states touted their own investigatory powers, um, listing you know, what, what various states have the authority to do under their own state laws, which is an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting reaction to a comment um, on, on the federal CFPB CID process. But one, one point that jumped out at me that I just thought was, was from a practitioner standpoint, a defense practitioner standpoint, you know, a, a, um, potentially, it may be accurate, but a potentially problematic interpretation is that, you know, several of the states, and this is, this was echo, again, this is echoing Peter's slide about the Morton Salt case, um, noted that they can in, initiate an investigation merely on suspicion that the law is being violated, or even just because they want assurance that it's not being violated. Um, and this is the official curiosity standpoint, or sorry, the official curiosity standard. And so, you know, for, for companies that are within the crosshairs of a state attorney general investigation, you really don't want it just a curious. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's not a great. It's not a great position to be in to have a very curious uh, attorney general and have no recourse for opposing um, just a, a general curiosity or a fishing expedition type of CID. So that um, the fact that they staked out a position on that, and granted, it's only with respect to New Mexico, Maryland, Pennsylvania, California, among other states. Um, it just resonated with me that that's. It's an interesting uh, lens through which the, these states are viewing their own powers and, and should cause all of us to, to, to pay attention. Um, on the database front, um, you know, it was interesting because, to me, because the, 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 the states go through the whole process as to why this database is completely appropriate and was properly vetted through the you know, notice and comment period. But it also gave some insight into how the states themselves use this database, which, again, from an industry perspective, is concerning given that there's no validation or, or you know, the, the, the CFPB is not attesting to the accuracy of these complaints. Um, but the states say that they use the CFPB, the CFPB database regularly to identify causes that they want to take up. And that in addition to the publicly facing version of the database, the states have their own um, more uh, expansive access to the database, which has additional information that you know, the, the public would not be able to see. So the, the, the states specifically said that they have used information gleaned from the CFPB's database in connection with investigation into debt collection companies, student loan servicers, for-profit universities, and other companies whose misconduct was initially brought to our attention through a critical mass of complaints filed with the CFPB. And again, that perfectly aligns with the, the, the hot button issues, specifically student lending. Um, so uh, I, I thought that, that those were both pretty uh, interesting comments, both from what they, they show about the support for the CFPB and also what they show about their own investigative practices. Very interesting, and anybody who follows um, the conversations around the CFPB's com consumer complaint database knows that um, stakeholders of all different stripes have long either embraced it or run from it, arguing that it's not fair and it doesn't accurately reflect the nature of a complaint or it disproportionately weighs a complaint over another complaint, et cetera. Um, so it's fascinating that the states are using it as well um, as the CFPB, right. and it's it's certainly telling. and it's definitely useful to know that at this juncture in time, it seems likely that that consumer complaint database isn't going anywhere, and everyone listening to this phone call should be mindful of whether or not there are consumer complaints about their services and products on that database, because it's not just the Bureau looking at it, but it's uh, lots of state AGs who maybe have uh, curiosity. Uh, curiosity, yes, <laughs> curious <laughs> agendas, um, which, uh, which speaks volumes about where they're going next. Um, one of the issues that is very, um, that, that really animated the Dodd-Frank Act um, in 2010 when it was being uh, discussed in Congress and then ultimately in 11 when it took effect is the role and interplay between the state consumer laws and the federal consumer laws and th the questions around preemption. And anybody who followed um, a lot of the conversations around the National Bank Act and the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of Currency for years, knows that um, the, the National Bank Act has, has frequently been interpreted to confer um, fairly extensive preemption um, on as to state laws. 
And in fact, the Dodd-Frank Act um, kind of contemplated some of this back and forth. Um, Joe earlier mentioned um, Section 5552 of the Dodd-Frank Act, which is the provision that basically says state AGs and state regulators can use um, the CFPA to pursue causes of action, except against nationally chartered banks. Um, and one of the issues that has been hotly litigated for years is the role of federal preemption in the consumer protection space, and how far into, um, you know, how, how far how far reaching are, are federal uh, laws, and, and for example, the National Bank Act, how much um, preemption does it confer? We know, for example, that state attorneys general um, can't um, subpoena national banks, um, but we also know that they frequently and in fact have recently um, been aggressively questioning national banks in connection with some consumer finance related matters. And so, you know, I, I'm curious to hear from, from Peter and Meredith about their, ex and Joe as well, about their experiences in this space, because I actually think that um, as, as intellectually wonky as preemption is, and it, that's one of my favorite topics, but it, it actually has a, a serious um, practical effect on the way that companies think about um, their business, the way they structure, um, and in fact, sometimes seek certain types of charters. And um, more specifically, I don't think this is at all settled. Um, it, you know, even with the Dodd Frank Act kind of contemplating the the, the, the balance between state consumer laws and federal consumer laws, you, you still have a real seesaw effect, and we're seeing this play itself out in a lot of different places. Um, and I don't know, Meredith, if you want to start maybe with, I know you, you've spent some time looking at this issue more recently, and then I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as well, Peter, and, and Joe, what you've seen as well. Sure. So, so the issue that I've, <clears throat> that I've been focusing on is the preemption questions that have arisen in the, in the student loan servicing uh, area, and it's a really fascinating and ongoing um, debate and <laughs> dispute between the states, and in, in this case, it's really the Department of Education um, over who gets to regulate federal student loan servicers, and you know whether the Higher Education Act should preempt some of the state acts that. Uh, purport to regulate student loan servicing and debt collection. And in October of 2017, the state's attorneys general wrote to the secretary of the Department of Education and flagged that student loan servicers were arguing that they were not subject to state enforcement and oversight because of uh, protections that they claimed under the Higher Education Act and said that they were already supervised and subject to the rules of the Department of Education. And so therefore, they didn't need additional supervision and that by subjecting them to two potentially contradictory regimes that they would not be able to carry out their duties because they couldn't discharge the requirements under the Higher Education Act and their federal loan servicing contracts and also comply with, with state law. Um, the state attorneys general wrote to the Department of Education rejecting that theory, saying that there, you know, there's always been a role for the states to regulate um, these servicers and, and collectors, and that to, to not allow them to do so is presents a real risk to consumers. Um, in March of 2018, the department, I don't know that it was responding directly to the state attorneys general, but certainly to, to the questions that had arisen around this preemption question, provided an interpretation of the uh, oversight that states and the, the federal government have regarding student loan servicing. This interpretation is non-binding, but it's very illuminating as to what the Department of Education sees its role as being and also the state's role <laughs> as being. Um, the Department of Education essentially, in a nutshell, said that, uh, you know, they don't want the, the servicers and collectors to be subjected to dueling requirements and that the, you know, the uniformity that is called for for federal student loan servicing is really maintained by applying one set of standards and that's the federal set of standards. Um, and also that the federal government itself and the Department of Education carefully monitor and scrutinize all of the services that are provided under the loan servicing contracts. Um, the department stated that it wanted to clarify its view that the state regulation of the servicing of direct loans, federal loans, impedes uniquely federal interests 
and that state regulation of the servicing of the federal loan program is preempted to the extent that it undermines uniform administration of the program. Um, the department expressed concern that imposing state law requirements may conflict with legal regulatory and contractual requirements um, under the federal programs and may skew the balance the department has sought in calibrating its enforcement decisions to the objectives of the program. And this has had real world implications as far as ongoing litigation because a number of, of uh, federal loan servicers have tried to argue that state enforcement actions against them cannot be brought or you know, should be limited because of this federal preemption issue. To date, the courts have not been especially receptive to these arguments um, and have recognized that the, the states uh, do have uh, enforcement authorities. All these are all trial court level decisions, and so it's unclear as to how it will resolve itself as the, 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 the cases move through the process. Um, but it's certainly a very hot issue and one that, um, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's right now it's limited to it's the Department of Education and the, and the student lending space, but it could potentially, I would think, bleed into other industries as well. And the Dodd-Frank Act, you know, contemplates this back and forth, um, although I'm not sure, candidly, it contemplated the back and forth in the student lending space. It definitely did in the National Bank Act space, um, and, and that for a very long time was, you know, going back to Supreme Court arguments in Wachovia, um, you know, there was a lot of back and forth between the OCC's interpretation of certain financial services requirements and states' um, more aggressive enforcement of its, their own consumer finance laws um, and consumer protection laws. Peter, I'm <laughs> curious what you've seen in this space, um, both in terms of the, the role that the state AGs play and how they kind of navigate around some of the more um, settled preemption arguments that have been made, for example, in the bank space. Well, the, the uh, Luznak case is a, a good example, although not a state AG case. It was consumer class action uh, against banks <coughs> for failing to pay interest on uh, escrow accounts uh, pursuant to a California state statute. And uh, the OCC uh, filed a, uh, an amicus brief asserting that the California statute was preempted uh, by the Dodd-Frank Act, and the court rejected that argument. Now the case is, there's a petition for cert pending in that case. We'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Uh, but, but clearly there's a limit to how far the courts are gonna go with uh, finding preemption of state statutes, particularly where it's in a, a space where the states have traditionally uh, uh, occupied uh, regulatory authority. And I think that the same is true with uh, the AGs. You know, they're gonna continue to focus on their enforcement, and I think that to the extent that uh, the OCC or the CFPB wants to argue that their uh, authority is preempted, they're going to be butted up against the, the express grant of authority to state, state AGs to enforce the CFPB and their own state laws. And, you know, it's interesting if you kind of harken back to the beginning of our presentation, when we talked about what, what really spurred our interest in this was, was um, acting um, Director Mulvaney's statement to the NAG that we're going we're gonna to let the states do their thing. Um, it's interesting to reconcile that instinct with the arguments that the National Bank Act um, aggressively preempts a lot of consumer protection laws in place in states that have historically been enforced, notwithstanding some of the OCC preemption arguments and regulations and guidance that has been issued in the past. Um, and Joe, I'd, I'd like to kind of get your thoughts on that since you, I know, spent some time really looking at Director Mulvaney's thoughts on these issues and how, how we marry that up with what we're seeing, you know, the OCC filing an amicus just in April of this year um, in, a, in a fairly, I think, a fa making a fairly aggressive argument about the role of the National Bank Act and how aggressively it, it can preempt enforcement of state laws in California at least. Yeah, it's um it's hard to know what exactly is in Mulvaney's head, especially because as you know, there you know it seems like he could go either way on this and have a sort of you know logically consistent basis for doing so. Um, part of me wonders if even his you know dual role of you know also um, 
you know, his budget hat. I wonder if part of that feeds into his wanting to be sort of restrained for the for the bureau. Um, you know, he's been trying to cut that budget, and if you know they're less active, um, and also try to you know stop states from doing the same. I think you know that could accomplish that objective as well. I would say I, so. I was that Mulvaney's speech, yeah, uh, in front of the NAG, and my takeaway from it was a little bit of he's washing his hands of it. And he said, you guys can go do what you want to do, and maybe we'll help you, but don't look for us to lead the wagon. And so, you know, I think that he sort of said to him, you know, you can enforce the laws or the CFPB as best you see fit, but don't look for us to lead the way. And do you think that was his position because he was trying to basically argue that the, you know, take a much more, um, a much less aggressive position um, for the CFPB, especially in the enforcement space, which we see, which we've been seeing. That's exactly right. And in fact, he said, uh, you know, don't look for regulations from us. The regulations will come out of the enforcement actions. Interesting. So, you know, it was all a little bit of a, you guys take it over, we'll stand back and watch how you're doing. And yet we continue to see, I have to say, in our own practice, um, you know, we've got some active CFPB matters that are still going on, um, especially litigation matters, Meredith and I. And, um, you know, we haven't seen them really change their tune. Um, I think what we're seeing, and we, and we know of instances recently, and we have some clients who've unfortunately received civil investigative demands not that long ago. So, so the, the Bureau is still out there doing enforcement actions and, and taking enforcement positions. And for example, in RD Legal, they didn't recede. They didn't say, okay, Southern District of New York, we're going to pack up and go home. They, they are seeking an interlocutory appeal to the Second Circuit. So I don't think it's the case that the Bureau is necessarily um, going away completely, but it sounds like what he maybe was saying to the National Association of Attorneys General and what he said in the past, Mr. Mulvaney, is, look, we're not going to be out there necessarily at the forefront of this. Um, you know, we'll take positions as we need to. We'll kind of stick, we'll hew pretty closely to what we think the letter of the law says, but we're not going to go out there and, and try and build out a doctrine aggressively. But if you want to, go ahead, states. That's exactly right. And, you know, going back to the beginning of our presentation, the, the, the cons- Consumer Financial Protection Act, Title 10 of the Dodd-Frank Act, contemplates that. It contemplates a scenario where you might have a less active CFPB and a more active group of state AGs pursuing um, UDAP claims, unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices under the CFPA, and, and building out that doctrine, which um, is intellectually really interesting because it's not often that you see a scenario where an agency in some way, directly or indirectly, cedes some amount of its doctrine building authority to a group of states, you know, many of whom might have um, somewhat inconsistent approaches to what's abusive. I mean, a deception and unfairness are more uh, more clearly articulated in laws already because they, they follow the Federal Trade Commission Act, but abusive is a new doctrine. Um, and in that vein, I think it would be helpful for us to maybe spend a little time talking about kind of trends and takeaways, what we see over the next year. Um, Peter, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts, and, and I'll start with you. Um, what, 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 are, what should we be expecting next? Um, and, and let's call it over the next year and a half, um, you know, maybe the, the first part of, of Craninger's stay in the CFPB, and as we see state AGs, who are up, many of whom are up for election this coming November, what are we going to see going forward in this space? You know, I'd say as, as Meredith pointed out, there's you know, 30 some HEs who are up for re-election um, this year. I think that uh, the, the result will be for the Democrats who win, they'll be aggressive and they'll be out trying to enforce uh, both the, the CFPA as well as their own state laws and trying to build a record for consumer protection. The, the, the Republican AGs, I think, are more likely to stand back a little bit. Uh, to you know, I don't know if they'll actually go out and continue to take the position that uh, the CFPB is unconstitutional, but they're not going to aggressively enforce uh, the consumer protection laws uh, under the CFPA or under their states unless you know there's a real crying need and they feel like they've got to step in and protect the consumers in their states. And Joe, what do you think is going to happen here? Um, you know, you've been following, for example, RD Legal Funding, which is which is an unusual case. But what do you what are you seeing in your space? Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like there there's you know there are two different ways to sort of suppress state enforcement. That you know, if they try to go the federal route under the CFPA, you now have this path with the RD Legal Funding case to um, to basically they can't do that because the entire statute's illegal um, or unconstitutional. And then if 
you know, they instead turn to their own state law, you know, they then run up against preemption issues potentially. So there's, you know, there's two different ways now to, um, to try to, you know, defend against these effectively. Um, and yeah, again, I just think that, you know, to try, trying to make sense of what um, Acting Director Mulvaney is doing, it could just be explained by the fact that he's trying to have his department expend as few resources as possible. And um, that could explain both why he, uh, he doesn't want the Bureau to bring enforcement and that could, you know, consistently also explain why he doesn't want, you know, the Bureau wasting any of its time or money trying to stop states from doing it either. And Meredith, what are what are your predictions for um, trends and takeaways given your practice and kind of what you spend your uh, <laughs> your days and evenings thinking about these days? I, I would expect to see in the in the blue states more efforts to replicate an Obama era CFPB at the state level, and a takeaway that you know practical takeaway that I that I have is that you know I think it it if it's good to be proactive and to to look at what the states are doing. And I thought that the letter with respect to the CAPB database is very illuminating. You know, if I I think it's it's worth spending some time on the CFPB complaint database and the state level ones to the extent that the states are starting to implement their own, as in Virginia, and be proactive to anticipate where the states might go next, even if the CFPB is taking a more of a back seat. Um, and whether that be with specific trends or you know specific complaints within your own business that consumers are lodging against um, you know the businesses in the in the public in the public sphere. Yeah, I um, I echo all of this. Um, you know what I think we're going to continue to see are very curious uh, to borrow Meredith's phrase, um, curious or maybe the AG's phrase, some some very curious and aggressive state AGs. Um, one of the interesting things that I think is, is, is noteworthy and important to keep in mind is, um, you know, the advent of the CFPB brought with it a whole core group of not only um, uh, expectations in the consumer financial protection world, but a lot of people who are now thinking about those laws independently of other things. And those people aren't going away. Um, they're necessarily, you know, maybe taking posts elsewhere. For example, we do see certain state attorneys general like New Jersey, like Maryland, like D.C., like Pennsylvania building out consumer protection units, often with folks who I, I know from my days at the CFPB. Um, so those laws aren't going anywhere. The know-how associated with enforcing those laws um, is not going anywhere. Um, the interest in protecting consumers in the financial services space is now front and center. It's not just front and center for the CFPB, it's front and center for the FDIC. Um, we've seen an increasingly aggressive FDIC. Um, even the OCC is, is looking at these issues more aggressively than it had in the past. And so even if we take a step back and say maybe the states will be more aggressive, we're still going to see some, some noteworthy issues um, pop up um, on the federal radar going forward. Um, and then I think the other takeaway I would say is, look, um, if you're in a consumer-facing business, every component of your business that touches consumers in the financial services space still needs to be carefully monitored and managed um, because it's continuing to be scrutinized by law enforcement at the state level and at the federal level. And if you fall on the radar of a state AG, you're going to get somebody who has a fairly broad authority to investigate you and scrutinize you. And if you fall on the radar of your regulator in the state, they can yank your license as well. So it's really important to continue to, you know, kind of follow best practices in this vein. Um, I really, really want to thank everybody today. We had a fantastic panel and just a great conversation, Peter, Meredith, and Joe. And I want to thank all of our audience members who've participated the last 90 minutes. Thank you for giving us part of your Friday afternoon. Um, you will also be receiving uh, continuing legal education credits for this. I understand that that information will be mailed out to attendees of today's session. In addition, you can go on our website, venable.com, and download the webinar today. Um, I think in the next day or two, the recording of this webinar will also be available along with the PowerPoint that we presented. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, and we look forward to uh, working with you again. Thank you.